if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. I want to thank the George C. Marshall Foundation for inviting me to speak today. It's a great pleasure. I only regret that I am not able to speak to you in person, but I hope that this online talk will give you some sense of the work that I have done in my book, Information Hunters. The Information Hunters were an unlikely band of American librarians, archivists, scholars, spies, and soldiers whose wartime effort was centered on books and documents. They gathered enemy publications in the spy-ridden cities of Lisbon and Stockholm, searched for records and liberated Paris and in the rubble of, Germ of Berlin. They seized Nazi works from bookstores and schools and unearthed millions of copies of books hidden in German caves and mine shafts. Improvising library techniques in wartime conditions they contributed to allied intelligence, safeguarded endangered collections, and restituted looted books. And at the same time, they built up the international holdings of leading American libraries for the post-war period. We're all very familiar with the Monuments Men, the uh, unit of the Army, the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives unit that was engaged in preserving um, and restituting um, artworks and other kinds of cultural monuments. My story is a little bit different here because books um, range into a number of different areas, but you will find that there are certain um, parallels with some of the activities of the Monuments Men, and some do actually appear um, in my uh, book and presentation. I want to begin with these two men. William Donovan and Archibald McLeish, who are emblematic of the developments that I want to describe today, and in fact gave them a kind of start, a jump start, for a particular kind of intelligence gathering involving um, open sources, publications, um, books, and the like. Both men were interventionists, um, and they came together in 1940 and 41 to talk about how to best serve the country um, in terms of information at a time when uh, there was a great deal of concern that the United States would get into the war. William Donovan convinced um, Franklin Roosevelt to establish what was initially called the coordinator of information, a significant word, that information. It later was renowned as the Office of Strategic Services. Um, which he headed. This was the first um, coordinated civilian um, intelligence agency in, um, in the country and was an extremely important effort during World War II. Archibald McLeish, of course, was the famed poet, playwright, and at the time, librarian of Congress. He too was an ardent interventionist and he called upon librarians to understand themselves as defenders of freedom and not only custodians of culture. He believed that knowledge was crucial for a free world and for the success of the United States as it was pursuing its war aims. The two men came together to collaborate on an effort to acquire um, and analyze um, open source materials, openly available publications that would reflect information about the enemy. I should say that during the 1930s, there were many ideas about information already swirling um, in the United States and also in Europe. Um, there were calls for universal information and international cooperation. There was rising nationalism at the same time with the establishment of the National Archives, an archival awakening that was very important for um, the United States. Americans turned to microfilm as a possible technology that would increase the ability of people to access 
materials that were otherwise rare or hard to come by, um, or that could be used um, immediately, for example, for scientific um, understanding. The Library of Congress itself began to see itself as a national library, and there were other efforts to bring together um, a, a kind of feeling of cooperation around the country. By World War II, this information consciousness um, had really developed, and around the country there were public libraries with war information centers where um, ordinary citizens could get the information that they needed. Meanwhile, as the United States um, uh, looked on, Europe descended into war. I want to tell you about one librarian who sort of fought her own war, her own war of resistance, um, prior to the United States becoming, um, uh, being in the war, declaring war in Europe and, in Japan, and against Japan. Um, this was Jose Meyer, who was a 45-year-old American woman uh, who lived in Paris, uh, working for the publisher Hachette and part-time for the Library of Congress. I have not been able to find a photograph of her, so imagine a fairly petite, um, blonde, blue-eyed uh, woman in her uh, mid-40s. She was in Paris when the Germans occupied the city in June of 1940. She had no money, her passport had expired, and she did not want to leave her possessions behind. She had a dozen cases of books, five trunks, a collection of war materials for the Library of Congress, and a lot of heavy furniture. She wrote Archibald MacLeish very moving, powerful letters saying after the um, Germans had marched in, the outlook is very dark indeed. And yet, as I said, she fought her own uh, war of resistance. She took photographs of the German occupation, she collected books in out-of-the-way bookstores that had been banned by the um, occupying um, government. She even acquired a list of banned books called the List Auto, um, borrowed from a gendarme who told her he, she could copy it overnight and return it to him. Um, and she investigated the book trade, including the looting of, um, of Jewish bookstores um, and libraries, and sent her report to to Washington, along with ephemera that she had collected. Um, finally, she decided to leave Paris in December 1940. She got an export per permit to take her personal effects. And at the last minute, she switched her furniture for her war collection, and she accompanied it to the United States. And McLeish saw her as a pretty amazing um, uh, individual who gave the promise of the potential for inter information gathering that would be realized after war had been declared. In 1941, the OSS um, oversaw an interdepartmental agency. It was called the Interdepartmental Committee for the Acquisition of Foreign Publications, or IDC. And this um, group was set up with the co cooperation of the Library of Congress to um, send agents to neutral cities around the world to acquire newspapers, periodicals, scientific reports, technical manuals, and the like, with the idea that they would be brought to the United States and analyzed um, for the war effort. They could be used to assess enemy troop strength, for example, industrial capacity, transportation networks, morale, and similar subjects. So agents were sent to several cities around the world to gather these materials. Only one of them was a woman, this woman here, Adele Kyber, who headed the operation in Stockholm. Adele Kyber was an unusual woman. She grew up in Hollywood, in a Hollywood uh, film family, but she herself was a scholar and went to the University of Chicago to get a PhD in medieval linguistics in 1930. She couldn't get a job um, it, given discrimination against women in academia at that time. And instead she went to Europe to do her own research and to work for professors back at home 
um, researching and um, copying materials for them from rare books uh, collections and archives. She saw people in Europe taking photographs in archives with small cameras, with Leicas, and she learned how to do this kind of photography. And she was in Europe in a, in a library in Germany when war broke out. She finally found her way to Lisbon and returned home um, to the US. And then 18 months later, was sent by the OSS to Stockholm to set up a microfilm operation known as the Anglo-American Microfilm Unit. She worked with the British um, to acquire um, publications to microfilm. She also had contacts in the clandestine press and in the Danish resistance. And she was enormously successful at this um, effort. She did, uh, these microfilm units abroad um, had to take their, um, the film reels without developing them. They sent them back to the United States or to London for development. And so um, technical skill was very important. She was quite successful at this and in fact produced over 3,000 reels of microfilm during her time in Stockholm. Another center of um, OSS activity was Lisbon. Um, this, of course, was a hotbed of intelligence, of espionage, of refugees and the like, well known um, as a kind of center of spies. Um, to Lisbon were sent um, several librarians, two for the OSS, one of them, Ralph Carruthers, a microphotography expert at the New York Public Library, another, Ruben Pice, who was a relative of mine, my father's oldest brother, and the means by which I got into this project. He was a librarian at um, Harvard, multilingual, and was sent to assess um, um, and collect materials that could be used for intelligence analysis. A third individual was Manuel Sanchez, who came from the Library of Congress to, lect, to collect for their purposes. They developed networks of contacts in bookstores and news dealers, including this bookstore, Livrario Portugal. Um, and the bookstore was owned by allied sympathizers who went to Spain to collect books for the US um, which, and other materials, uh, journals, uh, periodicals and the like, which were um, um, sent back to the United States. The use of microfilm was incredibly important. There was only limited um, space allotted on the clippers, uh, the aircraft that, were, that um, still went between the US and Portugal. And um, so this effort was a kind of vast undertaking. In the, by the end of the first year of operation, 1942, over a million pages had been microfilmed um, and then duplicated for many different wartime agencies. It was very hard for them to use these materials because the microfilm was um, done in a kind of haphazard way. And so librarians back in the United States developed um, mechanisms, sort of early information science, to shift from a library point of view to the point of view of the information in the publications. They would disaggregate the publications, creating nuggets of information they would classify these, index them, um, organize them, create abstracts of articles, even do full tra text translations in 42 languages. This before there were computers to help with this work. And so several hundred people, mainly women and emigres, did this job. These outposts in neutral cities became less important as the war wore on. There was simply less information there, reliable information to be found. Instead, the operation turned to what were known as T forces or target forces and documents teams after D-Day. These teams followed troops into newly liberated or occupied areas um, in, in Belgium, France, and then ultimately in Germany. Um, and these collecting teams essentially scooped up whatever seemed to possibly uh, contain information that might be helpful for the war effort, for the post-war occupation, 
for the prosecution of war crimes or for the war in Japan or and relations with Russia. So there's a whole range of topics that were of interest to these documents gathering teams. One member of a T force was Ross Lee Finney, who was a modernist composer um, and a professor at Smith College. And he um, operated largely in France and Paris and um, wrote voluminous letters to his wife. So we have a good idea of what it was he was doing. He said at one point that he, quote, had to adopt slightly different methods of acquiring foreign publications than I or anyone in Northampton, Massachusetts would use. Um, he was able to find, uh, his best day was on a Thanksgiving day when he found thousands of patent abstracts that um, could then be shipped to the United States. These documents teams and T-forces, um, as well as allied troops, uncovered vast quantities of books and other publications that had been stashed away in surprising places. In the wake of bombing raids, German authorities had decided to relocate their state archives, uh, their rare book collections, um, and many of their full library collections from the state libraries in caves, mines, and castles for safety. Um, this, along with art treasures um, and other um, valuable materials that had been looted by the Nazis. This um, mine, the Ronsbach mine, was a um, salt potash mine where gold, art treasures, and the costumes of the Berlin State Art Opera had been stored, along with millions of volumes of the Prussian State Library, as you can see here. And there was no card catalog to help people figure out what was stashed. So these, these posed a problem for America, the American occupation. What would be done um, with all these books? Meantime, back in the United States, the librarians were itching to get back into Europe once um, uh, victory in Europe had been declared. There was fierce competition among libraries. Um, this was not a genteel world, as we might think. And many of them tried to send their agents into war zones and occupied, occupied zones to try to get a jump on other um, libraries. The most successful of these was the Hoover Institution, um, which, whose library had been founded by former president um, Herbert Hoover. He actually had begun his collection back in the aftermath of World War I. And he had many contacts in relief agencies um, and other supporters around the world who collected materials for him. Um, likely because of his influence as an ex-president, he was also able to get some of his friends and um, representatives into Europe to begin to collect um, documents, archival records, and rare materials for um, the Hoover Institution Library. And these are two men who did this work, Louis Lochner and Frank Mason, who were journalists. And their major role, of course, uh, in uh, August of 1945 was to do, was to write news stories, but they also engaged in a collecting mission for the Hoover Library. One of the means they used that was um, most successful, in fact, was to acquire um, care packages. And of course, care packages had a connection to Hoover as well with his relief um, efforts after World War I. And because of the uh, great um, hunger of uh, and limited um, calories that the Germans um, were on after World War II, um, the care package was an incredibly powerful um, um, gift. And in fact, it became one means of sort of transacting exchange of people giving a valued diary or archival material to the Hoover Library in exchange for food relief. So this kind of competition among libraries and a desire of um, many American researchers to get back into Europe to find the materials of Europe um, Push, help to push the Library of Congress to make a proposal to uh, the War Department and State Department, which was to set up a mission 
of the Library of Congress that would be a kind of single mission under the rubric of the, of the military that would go in and serve the purpose of acquiring books that had been published in the war years and were, had been unavailable to American libraries through normal um, commercial channels, which had been stopped. Now, one might think that this would be a very limited mission. Um, after all, there's only a certain number of books that had been published that research libraries might want. And in fact, the mass collecting missions sponsored by the government might have simply ceased or narrowed in scope when the war in Europe was over. But the opposite actually occurred because the military had needs too, not only the libraries. For the military, um, having people who could help assess and screen the vast quantity of materials that had been collected and were continuing to be collected um, was um, extremely important. There was a kind of mission creep that went on here and a reluctance to just say, no, we don't want to collect this material. We need to look at it, assess it, and then decide what to do with it. And so the military and the State Department gave approval to the Library of Congress for this mission. The head of the mission was Reuben Pice. He is the figure in the middle of this photograph with the pipe. He was already in Germany and was simply reassigned from the OSS to the Library of Congress. In a few months, this group of um, individuals in the trench coats arrived from the United States, including one of the, one of the deans of American librarianship on the right of, the, um, of your um, screen, uh, second from the right, um, Harry Leidenberg, who was 70 years old at the time that he went on this mission. The initial aim was simply to engage in buying books, to purchase books. And it was to rescue books that had already been ordered by such libraries as Harvard and Yale. Um, they'd been ordered before the war and had been set aside by the publishers in Leipzig, which was the center of German book publishing um, for whenever the piece would come. Now these books had actually, most of them had been put away for safekeeping out into the hinterlands, even though Leipzig itself was heavily bombed um, by the Allies during the war. The problem, however, was that Leipzig was in the Soviet zone of occupation. And so a delicate negotiation had to take place between the Library of Congress mission and their Soviet counterparts in order to, mit to permit them to bring trucks into Leipzig, pack up their these books and bring them back um, first to Berlin, then Frankfurt, and then ship to the United States. These, this was a successful effort and everyone was amazed at this, um, even as the Cold War was already beginning to um, be felt. At the same time, the Library of Congress found itself expanding its mission. There were many tempting targets as one a um, uh, member of a T4 said, and um, it was hard for bi these bibliophiles and people very committed to the historical record of, to preserving the historical record of Nazism and the war to let go of materials that weren't necessarily books or the kinds of materials they were supposed to be collecting. There was an enormous collection, for example, called the Rees Collection, um, which um, was split among many different places and efforts to salvage it were um, very, were ongoing. You can see here uh, in these photographs um, two um, uh, agents or an agent and a German librarian trying to figure out what should be salvaged from this sub-basement in a Nazi beer hall um, as late as August 1946. And this process had been going on really since the end of the war. There was a huge photograph collection that was found in a restroom um, in, in, in a restaurant and it was confiscated and a decision had to be made. Is this something that reflected Nazism and could be taken by the US or it was the cultural patrimony of Germany and should remain in the US? So these kinds of ethical questions were raised continuously as the um, Library of Congress mission was doing its work. Even more powerful in terms of expanding the mission was the question of what to do with Nazi and militaristic 
book collections and the principle of denazification, which was one that had been established by um, the four powers, um, came to the fore here. Um, initially, books with Nazi or militaristic content was sequestered in, you know, was removed from bookstores, from publishing houses, even from libraries and put under lock and key. Over time, there was a, an effort to expand what was defined by what the definition of Nazi um, content was, and not only to sequester this material, but to destroy it. Um, and in May of 1946, there was an order issued by the four powers to um, not only sequester books, um, but to um, destroy them. And these included books in public libraries, not research libraries, but public libraries. So when this news hit the American press, there was an outraged response. Um, Americans were, uh, had already condemned Nazi book burning and the, there was a certain amount of propaganda about the destruction of books by Germans and how that was you know, antithetical to um, American war aims and American ideals. And now here, the Americans seem to be burning books. Um, the occupation governor, um, Lucius Clay, um, in a, somewhat um, awkward statement said, well, we're not burning books, we're pulping books for paper pulp, which we desperately need in Germany. But this distinction did not quite carry the effect that he wanted. And so the Library of Congress mission was given the task of screening um, these books and preserving a certain number, um, up to 150 copies for research libraries initially in the United States and then worldwide, it was going to be a worldwide effort, as well as government agencies. And these books were brought to the United States, nearly 600,000 of them. They were allocated to over 100 research libraries across the country, all sorts of institutions, Harvard, New York Public Library, University of Illinois, Iowa, um, along with the Library of Congress in this cooperative um, acquisitions arrangement. The idea here was a goal that had been established in 1942 by um, Archibald McLeish and library leaders around the country, that the goal would be to ensure that a copy of every book published in the world would be somewhere in the United States. So here you see this idea of international holdings as being really crucial for not only for knowledge, but for national security. Finally, there's the question of looted books, the fate of the looted books. These books were overwhelmingly looted from Jewish institutions and individuals, although not exclusively. There were many from Masonic lodges, um, Catholic organizations, um, socialist and labor organizations. But overwhelmingly, these were looted Jewish books. Um, Alfred Rosenberg, the Nazi ideologists, had decided to create an institute for the study of the Jewish question in Frankfurt. This would essentially be a kind of study of, for advanced uh, learning um, related to um, Jewish history, culture, and peoples. and. Um, it seems a terrible irony that, that books were being collected at the same time that six million Jews were being murdered. But this was, in fact, what um, uh, Rosenberg and his looting teams were doing. When the American troops um, came into the area around in Frankfurt and around Frankfurt, they discovered um, these vast collections of looted materials. You see here this famous photograph of army chaplain and rabbi Samuel Blinder, who um, examined Torah scrolls in the cellar of Rosenberg's Institute. Um, the, there were over 150,000 um, volumes as well found in this cellar of the building which had on the top of the building been bombed. Nearby in a small village called Hungen, um, looted books, uh, 
about 2 million looted books were discovered in um, a tax office, in a church, um, in, a, in a brickyard, um, all over the place, often in incredible disarray. And the question of what to do with these books was a, an enormous one, and it was an unexpected one. Nobody really anticipated what, um, you know, that this would be a problem for the military and especially the monuments men to solve. At first, the effort was to collect these books and place them in an extant library, the Rothschild Library in Frankfurt. You can see some bomb damage there, but it was basically workable. Um, and a number of books were placed there with the idea that they would be identified and then restituted. A civilian um, named Glenn Goodman was placed in charge of these books. He was somebody who had been in an internment camp in Germany for the duration of the war. He was released when the Allies came in and he was officially a displaced person. Um, he went to a monuments man, men's office in Frankfurt and basically was given the job of organizing these materials. Um, and it was an overwhelming job. He, this was not something that he was prepared to do. Um, the, as more and more books were found, the question of what to do with them um, became increasingly acute. And from Ju July of 1945 until January of 1946, not a single book had been restituted. And really the operation just kind of ground to a halt. Finally, in early 1946, a decision was made to get this operation um, underway. And the books were all located, relocated to the Offenbach Archival Depot, as it was called. This was a big warehouse in, um, uh, in Offenbach, and it was organized by different floors. You can see here the intake floor with the crated boxes of books. The initial man in charge was Seymour Pomrenz, who was a, a military officer and a commanding presence, um, very good organizer and just insisted that this was going to be a success. And he was rapidly followed by Isaac Benkowitz, also a military officer, veteran of two world wars. The two of them were Jewish American and cared very deeply about the fate of these books. It mattered deeply to them. But the problem of identifying and restituting them was enormous. It would have taken many years for a team of people to open every book and try to figure out um, whose it was if there hadn't been some streamlined way to do it. And Benkowitz came up with this idea, which was to photograph the book stamps and ex libris plates that were in the books. Um, put them onto pages with numbers, and to have the German workforce who couldn't read Hebrew or Polish or many of the other languages that these um, book stamps came in, they would memorize the image. And if they found a book with that image, you know, so they would memorize a small number. Um, and then if they found that image, they would place that book in the numbered bin. And so this rapid sorting took place of the, an initial group of books. Um, and it was really a remarkable um, effort, you know, that over a few months, most of these books had been sorted through and many of them identified. At the same time, there were hundreds of thousands of books that were still unidentifiable or orphaned. Um, many did not have book stamps. Um, many didn't have um, signatures, um, they were defaced, they, had, they were d damaged by mold, uh, by dampness. There are many reasons why a book couldn't be identified. And of course, even if it was identified, finding the owner or the owner's heirs was extremely difficult um, given um, how many Jews had died um, in, uh, in this time. So, another solution had to be found to these identifiable books, what to do with them. And that is a very long story. It would take me an entire lecture to tell you that story. Um, but what occurred was that um, a Jewish organization 
was created. It was based in the United States, but with an international membership. It was known as Jewish Cultural Reconstruction. And over a few years time, Jewish Cultural Reconstruction gained the right to essentially be the successor agency of these books and to distribute them as it saw fit with the idea of um, restoring the Jewish community and Jewish cultural heritage to those who survived. And this was not a program that focused on, on the remainder of Jews in Germany or in Eastern Europe. It rather distributed books to Israel, about 43% went to Israel, and about 38% came to the United States. In the United States, they went to different um, theological seminaries, um, to yeshivas, to other religious and cultural Jewish institutions, as well as to some secular universities and the Library of Congress. Another group of books were distributed around the world to Latin America um, in particular, um, as well as England and a fairly small number to Germany. These decisions um, essentially were uh, reinforced an idea of restitution as a collective, um, as having a collective meaning, not an individual meaning. So I wanna highlight two women here um, who were involved in this final phase of the book effort, the book missions of the war years. Um, one of them was Lucy Schildkret Davidovich, um, who became a renowned uh, Jewish American historian of the Holocaust. Um, she herself um, had been a historian and researcher um, doing work in Vilna at the Yiddish um, Scientific Institute known as YIVO um, before the war, before the Germans took over um, that part of Poland and um, looted YIVO's books. Um, from the United States after the war, Davidovich went, back, went to Germany to work as part of the Jewish um, relief efforts. And she found herself at the Offenbach Archival Depot um, looking, for, sort of pleading for books to share with displaced persons, but then beginning to look at the books to try to identify them. And she didn't expect to spend very much time at Offenbach, but instead she spent four months. She reviewed 160 volumes of, of books and periodicals there at, at Offenbach and managed to identify 33,000 of them. Many of them, the recovered um, YIVO collections, which then were sent to New York City. Also involved in this effort is someone who's a familiar name to all, Hannah Arendt, the political philosopher, who during the war years was a researcher and executive uh, director of the organization Jewish Cultural Reconstruction. She was involved in compiling lists of um, Jewish cultural treasures that were in occupied, access occupied countries and distributing these lists so that people who were searching might have some idea of where uh, materials might be located. And uh, when she became head of Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, she was involved in looking for more books that had been looted and in the distribution process of those books. So she played a very important role um, during and immediately after the war in the fate of Jewish books. So in terms of the post-war legacies of, this, of these collecting missions during World War II and the role of librarians and scholars, archivists and the like, um, I would point in two directions. One is the books themselves and their role in American libraries. The Library of Congress mission, the denazification of books, and the Jewish cultural reconstruction books all embodied American initiatives and collecting during the war. You can see a few examples here from the library, my own library the, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. The two books on the top are books with Nazi content that were removed in the denazification effort and sent to um, the Penn Library. 
um, as you can see, they are basically pulp fiction. They were, one is a detective story, the other is a, ro a historical romance, and they were um, book, cheaply printed books uh, made to entertain and distract the troops on the front. They were known as field post books. The book on the bottom is um, from the uh, Cat Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at Penn, and it is a it was a looted, unidentified book. You can see on the left, there's a book stamp that shows it had been at Offenbach Archival Depot, that little round um, stamp in purple. On the right-hand side of the page is the book plate of Jewish cultural reconstruction, which had been put in the books um, as a record and memorial to the fate of, the, of, of Jews and the fate of their books during the war and of this remarkable effort to preserve cultural heritage in the wake of all the destruction. This, these book acquisitions efforts helped define the post-war intellectual order as an internationalist one, with the US in a dominant position. National security and intellectual leadership went hand in hand, and it required an expansive development of research libraries and international holdings. Another legacy, and maybe the most important legacy, is that these mission, wartime missions shaped the information science field after the war. Of course, after the war, computer technology was hugely important. Um, the growth of science and technical fields as well. Um, but what is interesting is how many figures who were involved in the wartime collecting found themselves at the leading edge of information management in the post-war period. Eugene Power, who founded University Microfilms International, um, was a microfilm expert called upon to um, advise on how to reproduce rapidly all of this, these enemy publications. His company now is ProQuest, the big information uh, giant. Jesse Shera was an OSS um, kind of organizational wizard who figured out how to manage a uh, card catalog that included materials not only the, of text but of um, visual materials as well. He went on to a distinguished career um, uh, in the areas of uh, technical automation and information science in library schools um, after the war. And Frederick Kilgore, who, um, who called me one night after I wrote him an email asking about my uncle, Reuben Pice, um, and told me he was the man who recruited Reuben Pice into the OSS. Frederick Kilgore was the executive director of the um, OSS agency that was acquiring enemy publications after the war he used his expertise to found the OCLC, which was a very early venture in um, technical cooperation uh, via, via computers and modems. Um, and OCLC, of course, has produced WorldCat, which is the largest international bibliographic database and which has a direct lineage to the war years. Little did I know when my book came out in January, that research librarians and faculty would again be called upon to mobilize in an emergency threatening our nation and the world. Um, I hope the story I've told today is, has been an interesting one to you that tells you something about a little known episode of World War II and how it was waged. But I also hope it's a little timely um, for you as we think about how to respond to, to the coronavirus pandemic and how that's going to reshape our world of knowledge and our repositories of learning. Thank you.